This is called the prototype jet transport. It evolved into a military airplane and a commercial airliner. And in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat, we're going to tell you the story of the interaction between these two types of aircraft. Tonight, we bring this to you by request. And my thanks to viewer Martin Pennock for suggesting this subject. We do appreciate that. I'm going to call it military airliners, and boy, there were plenty. Now, I'm not going to try and cover every one of these, uh, and this is just a partial list, but uh, this would be my, my first five-hour YouTube video if I tried to do that. So what I'd like to do is bring you what I consider the top 10 military airliners, and this is my own personal choice just based on the uh, ultimate impact that these airplanes had on uh, aviation history, both military and commercial. If I left out your favorite, feel free to mention that in the comment uh, section, and uh, we'll see what we can do next time. But let's start at the beginning. At top is the Douglas C-1, and at bottom is the Atlantic C-2. Never heard of an Atlantic C-2? Well, it's a Fokker F-10 trimotor, but the Army Air Corps back in those days, or Army Air Service, uh, didn't want to have a foreign airplane identified in a world record attempt uh, such as you see here. So they renamed it the Atlantic C-2. Uh, and this was a 1929 six-day, 11,000-mile endurance flight. These airplanes took off in January from Van Nuys Airport. And using aerial refueling, they flew a racetrack pattern between Los Angeles and San Diego. And the C-2 was nicknamed the question mark because no one knew when it would come down. But again, an amazing endurance flight six days in the air, uh, nonstop in 1929. Now I've mentioned that uh, military helicopters were adapted for passenger use, and that's a separate video on passenger helicopters. I'll uh, leave the link to that video at the end of this uh, presentation. But let's start with number 10, the Boeing Stratocruiser. This is an airliner uh, in its day, a very luxurious airplane but its roots were in a World War II bomber. The Boeing B-29, which served in the Pacific at the end of World War II, was the beginning of the idea for the Stratocruiser. And here's how it happened. They replaced the uh, R-3350 Wright Cyclone engines of the B-29 with a 3,000 horsepower, 28-cylinder Pratt & Whitney R-4360s, as you see here. And that airplane became the B-50. Uh, you notice the tail is quite a bit taller to deal with the uh, extra power. And then he took a B-50 uh, wing and tail and then uh, uh, wrapped those around a cargo uh, fuselage. So this became the C-97 Strato Freighter. And then they took the Strato Freighter and put an air refueling boom on it and wound up with the KC-97. And then they basically took the ultimate version of the uh, C-97 and made it into a passenger airliner, the model 377 Stratocruiser. This was a revolutionary airplane in its day because it featured a lower deck uh, club lounge with a spiral staircase up to the main cabin. The lap of luxury. Number nine, the Convair liner. And we're gonna begin with uh, the model 240. There were several iterations, but the 240 was adapted by the United States Air Force into the T-29 a navigator trainer. Uh, you can see the uh, domes up on the top of the fuselage there for aerial sightings. And uh, this uh, trained all the navigators up until the advent of the Boeing uh, T-43 jet, an adaptation of the 737. Uh, the Convair liners, later versions became the C-131 uh, VIP transport for the United States Air Force and the R-4Y, same mission for the United States Navy. Now, if you'd like to read about all these uh, great prop airliners and how they were adapted for the military mission, uh, I'd like to recommend a, a great book uh, from Specialty Press called America's Round Engine Airliners, written by my friend uh, Craig Cadera and William Pierce. Uh, we offer a special publisher's offer, 25% discount, and the details are uh, in the uh, link to Specialty Press in the title block below. Number eight the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Now we showed you uh, an airplane that was uh, 
a military machine first and then adapt it into an airliner with the Stratocruiser. This is the exact opposite. This is a commercial airliner that was adapted for a military mission. The DC-10 first flew in 1970. It was America's first tri-jet uh, wide-body airplane. And uh, it uh, was a, a successful airplane, although there were a series of unfortunate accidents. It had a, uh, a pretty good record and uh, retired uh, about eight or 10 years ago out of airline service, but the Air Force is still using it. Uh, it was modified into the KC-10 Extender and uh, that entered service in 1982. The KC-10, one of my favorite gee whiz facts about the KC-10, it was the first airplane that was capable of flying from New York to Sydney, Australia, nonstop on its internal fuel load. But 60 were built for the Air Force. One was lost in a ground accident. The other 59 are flying to this day. And uh, a use of the DC-10 that no one expected when it was first designed was that of a fire bomber. And with all the fires that are currently uh, raging around the world, and especially in the Western United States, uh, the DC-10s are providing a very valuable mission as aerial tankers. Number seven, the Lockheed Constellation. This is a neat one. The Connie uh, was the smallest of, the, uh, of its generation when it first flew in 1943. Uh, you can see it here with the DC-6 in the middle from Douglas and the Stratocruiser at bottom. But the Connie has an unusual distinction. It was both a civilian airliner and military transport uh, right about the same time because it was uh, initially uh, begun in 1939. And by the time uh, it was ready to fly, World War II had started. And so the Model 49 Constellation was adapted into the C-69 military transport. It was the world's most advanced airliner at the time, being fully pressurized with a 300 mile per hour top speed and a 3,000 mile range. Here we see the, uh, what we call the 049 Connie in Capital Airlines markings. And later models, the 749 was adapted into a uh, aerial uh, radar picket as they called it, the uh, radar warning aircraft that you see here. This is called the WV-1. Later versions of the Constellation like the 1049G became the WV-2. Here we see the Air Force C-121 version. And you see the upper and lower radome. Uh, here is the WV-2. Same exact airframe. Now, this is interesting. I wanted to mention that uh, the model uh, companies in the mid-50s uh, did exactly the same thing to the injection molds of their models as the manufacturers did to the real airplanes. So as an example, here we have the Ravel uh, model of the uh, 1049G in Eastern Airlines markings, and that was released in late 1956. 1957, the WV-2 version uh, came out, and uh, let me show you the actual buildup. This is the Eastern Super G Connie model, beautiful, beautiful model, and this is the airliner, and then the molds were literally changed into the WV-2 Connie, and the um, radomes were added and uh, markings were, were added. And it, this in itself is a, another beautiful model of the Navy version of the radar constellation. Number six, the North American T-39. This is a personal favorite. This is the first Air Force airplane I ever got to fly in uh, when I was in the Air Force in the late 1960s. Here we see it at LAX, North American's plant. Uh, it's a small airplane, but it had a pretty big impact on the uh, world of aviation uh, because the T-39 uh, VIP transport for the Air Force uh, became the Sabre Liner executive transport. And this airplane, along with its uh, larger brother, the Lockheed uh, Jetstar, which was the Air Force C-140, ushered in the age of what is called the BizJet, uh, the executive jet transports. Number five, Lockheed Model 14 Super Electra and Model 18 Lodestar. There's a whole bunch of different airplanes, but we're gonna cover the basics here. This is the uh, Model 18 Lodestar uh, as an airliner. And here you can see uh, the military version of the Model 14, uh, the Ventura uh, light bomber, but you can see the resemblance in terms of airframe. Uh, a good example of how these airplanes were adapted. If you look at the cargo uh, load, this is the Model 14 and especially the lower uh, cargo bays, you can see how that would be easily adapted into the uh, PV-2 Harpoon Navy version uh, torpedo bomber. 
and patrol aircraft. Number four, the de Havilland Comet. Now, before we get into the story of the Comet, let me show you these two British aircraft. These were World War II bombers converted into transport and tanker use for the Berlin Airlift in 1948. So at top, we have the Hanley Page Halifax, which became the halt and cargo transport. And below we have uh, the uh, fuel tanker version of the Avril Lancaster. And the, uh, that was called the Lincoln. And then the passenger version of the Lancaster was called the Lancastrian. So probably the most uh, direct adaptation of military aircraft for civil use. But the Comet One was the world's first jet airliner. It entered service in May of 1952. And in 1958, a larger and longer range version, the Comet 4, became the world's first jet airliner uh, carrying passengers across the Atlantic. And I remember the date vividly. It was Saturday, uh, October 4th, 1958. Uh, my dad took the whole family to uh, Idlewild Airport and we saw the Comet come in. And uh, as I mentioned in other videos about jet airliners, this was like seeing a spaceship landing from Mars. I could not believe the sight, the sound, the smell of the kerosene fuel in the air for the first time. It was, it was like seeing a, a glimpse into the future, uh, an unforgettable day. But the comet arrived and beat Pan Am across the Atlantic with their 707 by two weeks. The comet was adapted for uh, anti-submarine missions. Uh, first delivered in 1969, the Nimrod, the original Mark I, was the sub-hunter version of the Comet 4, and at that time was the world's only pure jet maritime patrol aircraft. Pictured here is the advanced Nimron MR2P delivered to the RAF in 2003. These airplanes were retired in 2011, and it's amazing to think that an airplane designed in the late 1940s served the military needs of the United Kingdom for more than 60 years. Number three, the Lockheed Electra. The Electra first flew in 1957 at Burbank, California. It was uh, the United States only four engine turboprop airliner. Uh, here you see uh, the takeoff at Burbank and there's a WV-2 Connie in the background. The Electra was uh, an amazing airplane, it had a 400 mile hour cruise speed and uh, was kind of the happy medium between pure jet and prop. But in 1962, the P-3 Orion was uh, developed and uh, delivered to the Navy. And like its British counterpart, the Nimrod, the P-3 Maritime Patrol aircraft enjoyed a nearly 60 year service life. The P-3 was replaced by the P-8 Poseidon, an adaptation of the Boeing 737-800. And I thought it was interesting to show the original 737 model 200. You can see how far that airplane came. Uh, the 737 entered service in 1967. Number two, the Douglas DC-3. The DC-3 was one of those airplanes that literally changed uh, air transportation and changed the world. It was the first airliner to make a profit for its operators, strictly carrying passengers. First flew on December 17th, 1935, the anniversary of the Wright Brothers flight. Here we see it at the Douglas Santa Monica plant. With the advent of World War II, the DC-3 was adapted into the C-47 Skytrain. Here we see the production line in Long Beach, California. And it's often said that they built 10,000 DC-3s. That's not accurate. Uh, it's 10,000 DC-3 type airframes. There was a little over 900 pure passenger DC-3s built and uh, uh, 9,000 plus C-47s. But uh, in all, 10,000 airframes, which is still pretty impressive. C-47 uh, just was considered as one of the top five uh, weapons of war responsible for the Allied victories uh, as judged by uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. C-47s were used in the Berlin airlift and later modified the Douglas Super DC-3 in the uh, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s, uh, adapted by the Air Force is the YC-129. You see it here uh, making a test JADO takeoff at Edwards Air Force Base. And it wasn't a very successful airplane for the Air Force, but the Marines adapted it uh, as the R-4D. And uh, the airplane went on to serve uh, into the uh, war in Southeast Asia. The top 10 military airliners, number one, the Boeing 367-80. You don't recognize that designation? How about 
Boeing 707. Started life as the Model 367-80, rolled out in 1954. Uh, it, soon after its uh, first flight in July of 54, it uh, was uh, setting records flying to all sorts of destinations across the United States. And this was kind of a harbinger of things to come. It was the beginning of the jet age in the U.S. as we came to know it. It was a beautiful airplane, uh, very simple and elegant. And the revolutionary aspect of a 35 degree swept wing, potted engines. Here we see the early versions of the military J-57. Uh, and it gave uh, the airplane uh, 600 mile an hour uh, top speed. And it was just a revolutionary machine, really changed uh, the, the face of commercial aviation. However, a certain Air Force general, Curtis, uh, Curtis LeMay, who was the head of the Strategic Air Command, uh, was very impressed with the airplane. And uh, then it was adapted for service with the Air Force as the KC-135 Strato tanker. And this solved a big problem because as good as the KC-97s were, uh, it, it was a problem with those prop airplanes refueling jet bombers like the B-47 and B-52, and the KC-135 was the answer. 135s went into service in 1957, and a year later, the 707 uh, was adapted and uh, went into service in late 1958. Here we see a TWA airplane. Uh, they began service with Pan American. And uh, this was, again, an adaptation of the 135 with a wider fuselage, so it allowed six across seating in the cabin and some aerodynamic refinements. And the 707 was the first United States jet airliner. The 135 evolved also. Here it is fitted with uh, fan jet engines. And you notice that the refueling boom is missing. This is the C-135 uh, cargo transport version for the uh, military air transport service. What's interesting is that the internal Boeing designation for this airplane was 717. And that number was brought back uh, oh, 10 years or so ago when uh, Boeing uh, merged with McDonnell Douglas and the MD-95 twin jet airliner version of the DC-9 was renamed the Boeing 717. The 707 was adapted for military use and became uh, the first Air Force One, although that term wasn't used at that time, but the VC-137 was used by General Eisenhower and uh, President Kennedy. Uh, and then this is the VC-137B. The VC-137C is the famous uh, 26,000 aircraft uh, used by uh, President Kennedy and up into uh, the Reagan era. The intercontinental version of the 707, uh, this is the Model 420 seen here with uh, Rolls-Royce engines. Uh, this was the intercontinental version of the a jet airliner that really revolutionized air travel and brought airfares down and created uh, travel for the mass public in ways that had never been seen before, uh, not to mention snuffing out the ocean liner as the prime method of transportation across the Atlantic. The 320 series uh, seen here fitted with Pratt, uh, fan, Pratt and Whitney fan jets uh, became the baseline for a number of military adaptations, which we'll tell you about in a moment. Um, I have a personal soft spot in my heart for this particular airplane because I flew on this exact airplane uh, on a Mack charter from Travis Air Force Base to Yokota, Japan via Honolulu. And uh, that was my deployment to Japan uh, when I joined the Air Force in 1967. But the 707-320QC, as you see here, quick change or convertible freighter CF, uh, was adapted into the uh, Boeing E3A AWACS. AWACS stood for Airborne Warning and Control. It was fly, uh, a flying headquarters. The giant radome that you see at the top was a Westinghouse ANAPY-1 rotating radar antenna. And uh, this was an indispensable airplane uh, in the uh, latter part of the 20th century and serving uh, in, to this day. Another version of the 707-320 series is the Air Force E-6 and Navy E-8. This is called the J-STARS. J-STARS stands for Joint Surveillance Target Attack Radar System. Uh, this is a joint effort uh, between Boeing and Grumman, which did the uh, avionics. And this is an electronic warfare airplane. Uh, again, an indispensable mission in today's uh, military need. Uh, pardon the low res of this uh, photo, but I took this from the cockpit of a B-52 uh, we were flying wing on the airplane that you see refueling on the boom. This is the final iteration of the KC-135, the, the 135R. It's fitted with uh, 
GE Snecma CFM 56 uh, high bypass ratio turbofans. And this is giving a whole new lease on life to this airplane, uh, coupled with airframe modifications, glass cockpit, and other systems upgrades. And what's amazing is that this uh, KC-135, which first flew, uh, the original design, which first flew in 1956, is going to serve the United States Air Force, uh, depending on uh, deployments and how it's used, uh, possibly for as much as 75 to 80 years. Just an unbelievable statistic, thinking of when this airplane first flew. So there you have it, the story of military and commercial airplanes, the interaction between the two types and how uh, airliners were adapted for military use and vice versa. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat by request. As always, we'd like to thank the good folks and the entities that allow us to bring these videos to you. My dear friends, Jeff Thomas and Tony Landis, the Douglas Library, Museum of Flying, and the Wings and Air Power Historical Archive. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.